We begin in the name of God. Greetings to one and all. Welcome to another session of From the Desk of Gamdi. The series of discussions in the 23 question series continues and today we are going to start the 61st episode in that series. The topic, what is the hadith, is under discussion. As you are aware, after completing the discussion on the basics of the topic, we present the objections and critical questions before Gamdi Sahab. Similarly, whatever has been said in exposition and explanation, if any issues arise from it, we are presenting them before him as well. Gamdi Sahab, I will begin that series today. Please explain. A narration is frequently presented that the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, said at one time, you will see that there will be people resting against cushions and when a command is given to them, they will say, we only accept what is in the book of God. The summary of this narration is that the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, convey to them that just as the Quran exists, similarly, there is this guidance that I have brought, this command, this sermon, these things I enjoin and prohibit. It is said by the scholars that in this narration, the Prophet himself presented the Hadith as comparable to the Quran. That is, the Quran and the Hadith are on the same level. What is your view on this? My opinion is that this is entirely correct. In this situation, the Prophet referred to a great truth and this is predicated on the Quran itself. The Quran has elaborated in various places that when a person is chosen by God to be appointed as a prophet, then he is endowed with two things. One is the revelation that the trustworthy Archangel Gabriel brings from the heavens. Sometimes it remains as oral instruction. At other times, it comes as the book of God. Revelation began descending upon the prophet. He was given instructions as a prophet. And then the book was given to him, which we now recognize as the Quran. The second thing is knowledge and judgment. This also has been described in the Quran. That is, a prophet does not possess any prior education. He did not acquire things through a method of trial and error. Like the way we gain knowledge of things, he did not become a scholar through that method. However, upon being appointed to the rank of prophethood, that ability is also granted to him by God. God grants it to him. It too is a gift of the divine, just like the Quran is one. In this as well, God Almighty grants in the same way as He does with the revelation of divine scripture. The only difference is that there, a word or a speech is sent from God Almighty. It can be in the form of words or infused into the heart. In this, God grants a capability just as He has given certain abilities to many people. The result is that on one hand, the prophet conveys the religion given by God. On the other hand, as the greatest and foremost scholar of the religion, he also explains and clarifies the religion. His explanation of religion is much more extensive than the Quran. At this time too, it is much more. That is, the Quran has 500 to 600 pages. But if you see the commentary by my esteemed teacher, it is in nine volumes. If you look at my commentary, it is also in five volumes. Therefore, the points stated in the Quran, when a knowledge tradition arises in their context and elaboration, it becomes much more than the Quran. For this reason, it is not implied here that something is being said in a certain rank or status. It is said that when you read God's book, then God's book will give you guidance. However, the details of that guidance, which will reach you due to the Prophet's knowledge, can be far more than that. I will give you two examples of this. You can understand it from them. God has stated in a sentence, do not consume wealth unjustly between yourselves. Methods that are not right, which violate human moral character, those ways should not be used to acquire wealth. We know that in our religion, life, wealth, and honor have been given sanctity. No person's property can be acquired through a sinful way, whether it be through theft, lies, or fraud. Now all the various subcategories or adjacent categories of these sinful ways will be elaborated upon by scholars as well as the prophet. It will become such a great list that as against that one sentence, one can produce chapters or even books on it. In my book, Mizan, I have quoted those narrations about the laws regulating economic life, where the prophet, peace be upon him, stated what transactions are not permissible. Each one of them has been enumerated and explained. Similarly, it has been explained on what principle it is based. 
So what is all this? Obviously, it is much more compared to a single verse of do not consume each other's wealth unjustly. And there is no doubt that just as God has given the Quran, He has given the Prophet the ability to apply it and inform you that this is the command of the religion. See, in your life, it is being applied to such and such things. Take a second example from the Quran. In Surah Araf, it is stated that among moral matters, five things have been declared as forbidden. Moreover, it is stated that among foods, good things are halal and bad things are haram. All these matters have been clarified by the Prophet. Similarly, those five things have been stated in a single verse which says, Among the things my Lord has forbidden are immoralities. Now what are the things included under immoralities? Further, it mentions infringement of bodily, property, and reputation-related rights. So what are the things under it? Which things are included under shirk? Similarly, what are the things that fall under innovations? So you can go on enumerating all this knowledge. As the Prophet conveyed the Book of God as God's messenger and explained the matters on which the Book of God commands action, likewise, you see, as a scholar, he would also explain the applications, explain ijtihadi applications, unravel linguistic nuances, unravel rational subtleties. If we compile his list, volumes could be compiled. This is absolutely correct. Now you may ask, what is that knowledge and where is it? We are telling you, it is the same knowledge that the companions gave to the Muslims. It has been transmitted further. It has been transferred in the form of our narrations. That knowledge is tafim and tabin. That is, the point stated in religion, whether in the Quran or the Sunnah, it is clarifying them in the same way or explaining them similarly or explaining their application in the same way as our commentators explain, theologians explain, and jurists explain. It was initiated by the Prophet, peace be upon him. It was begun by the Prophet. So this is the knowledge of the Prophet. People could not comprehend it in a separate way. This has led to a misunderstanding, though it is absolutely correct. You have corrected this point. In reality, the knowledge that has been transmitted to us, if you look at it in terms of its volume, then it is like the Quran. It is much more than that. Right, the point is clear. Okay, Gahamdi Sahab, when it has been said that I have been given something like the Quran, that is, whatever I am instructing you, this instruction is not separate from what is present in the Quran. There are orders, commandments, prohibitions. These are its corollaries, its explanations, its derivations, its clarification and elucidation. It's similar to that, or in terms of the result, what was required of you by God in the Quran, that is what I am conveying to you through this guidance as well. That is what God desired too, and on some occasions, its application as well. In the case of applications, it leads to the formation of a long list, that is, when it will be said in the Quran that immoralities are prohibited. So then, the prophets and the ulema will tell you about immoralities as to where all its application is made. Infringement of rights is prohibited, so a scholar will tell you its applications. The jurists are doing the same work, so this is not an extraneous work from the Quran. It is being done in accordance with that. The Prophet, peace be upon him, has given us the Book of God. So is it prohibited to write its commentary? No. We will write it, won't we? Doesn't it go far beyond the Quran? I have given you examples of it. There, where the Prophet has stated this, what has happened there, that is, the command of jihad, has come in the Quran. With regard to it, he gave some guidance. He, peace be upon him, warned the people that if my command reaches you, then it is actually the application of the Quran's commands. The Quran has given guidance in principles. I convey it to the details. The matters that the Quran has left to interpretive insight, I exercise ijtihad in them. As a result, whatever comes forward is the knowledge given by the Qur'an. I convey that as well. And the fact that you do not reject it anywhere, this is why we have said, we have discussed it, that I am the Prophet of God. Obedience is obligatory. Regarding me too, the Qur'an has said that when I say something and my decision is revealed, whether it is in a matter of ijtihad or in a personal matter, so it is necessary that this point is corrected and in accordance with the Qur'an. And the Qur'an has mentioned both of these things, that revelation is sent to the Prophet, 
and he is given knowledge and judgment. Right, Gramdi Sahab, the point is absolutely clear. As Gramdi Sahab has stated here, suppose the situation and the context is that in which the Prophet is going to take military action in Khaybar and the leader from the other side stands up and puts some allegations on the Muslims that they have arrived, they will destroy every generation, will set fire to the crops, will kill women without mercy. On that occasion, the Prophet gave a sermon and these are the words of that sermon in which he said that, I see that on the occasion of this war, Everyone wants victory, they want success, they also want the spoils of war. On that occasion, if you do not follow these instructions of mine, then it will be against the religion. And this excuse will not be acceptable that a person says that we have not found in the Quran that we should not burn the crops or do any other work. I am instructing you not to do this work. Okay, Gandhi Sahab, there the Prophet is present in front of them. If his guidance reaches me that I should not go beyond this line, then it is obligatory for me. However, in today's time, when I read his words in the corpus of Hadith, then the act of research before reading in this act of research, it is not at all negated that I will not obey your guidance or that I do not consider it worthy. It is the research of whether or not it was your guidance. This is obligatory. That is, this research is obligatory as the Prophet is no longer present in front of us. When people convey something to us, we will do its research. The principles of its research have been established. And in all this discussion, what have we clarified in these 30 to 35 sessions? We have said that there is no increase in religion. There is no decrease in religion as a result. This is its interpretation and explanation. That is, the religion is being explained. The religion is being elaborated. It is surprising that a scholar does this work and a great scholar writes a commentary or writes a book on jurisprudence, then we keep seeking and searching for it. If the knowledge of the Prophet of God is transmitted, then will we not try to seek, will we not search for it? What can be more unfortunate than this? All of this will be done. The companions have taken precaution that these things are not attributed to the Prophet in a wrong way. However, Whatever has reached us is a great blessing. We will investigate it. When we are satisfied that it is the statement of our Prophet, then in cases possessing multiple aspects, we also humbly accept them, as there is a great possibility of interpretive disagreement taking place. If we come to know that it is the speech of the Prophet, we will thank God that the matter we were understanding, in which we were unable to decide, but now a decision has come before us. That certainty we have achieved is the certainty upon which all our knowledge is based. What is the religion? It is the Quran and Sunnah, which have been transmitted through consensus and continuity. This is the knowledge of the Prophet, that is, the things he said to explain the religion from which the knowledge has come into existence, the knowledge that has come into existence from the decisions that have been made the knowledge that has come into existence from the answers given at some point, that knowledge is being transmitted and it was to be transmitted in the same way. If it has reached us, then we will investigate it as well. And if we are satisfied with something, that it is the statement of our Prophet, then we will not even turn our heads away from it. The point has been made absolutely clear. Okay, Khamdi Sahab, the statement that has been made here, indeed it is like the Quran or even more. Some people have interpreted it that the instruction of the Prophet refers to the Sunnah. What do you say about it? I have already made it clear that Sunnah is the compliance with the commands of the Quran. The Quran had told us that we have to follow the guidance of the previous Prophets. And this guidance was present in the case of the Prophet in the form of the religion of Abraham. All of this Sunnah is a part of the Qur'an. It is not a separate thing. It is the knowledge of the Prophet which is being mentioned. And the people who have said that it has appeared in the form of a Hadith, they are absolutely right. This is the thing. And there is no doubt that even now, if you see, the Qur'an is a brief book. In comparison to it, there is a lot of knowledge which has reached us. Now, we have to investigate it. We have to research it. If something wrong has been included in it, we have to remove it. All these are the things of the world of knowledge. The point has become clear. We move ahead. I have one more narration in front of me which people make some critical use of. Abu Huraira and Zaid bin Khalid, God be pleased with them, narrate that we were sitting with the Prophet, peace be upon him, and a person stood up in this manner. He said, 
I swear by God to you that you decide between us with the book of God. Then the second group stood up. He was more sensible. He also said, judge between us with the book of God. And then he asked for a decision. The incident as he narrated was that, I had a son who was a laborer in this man's house. He committed adultery with his wife. I gave him a hundred goats and a servant as a ransom. Then I inquired with the scholars and they told me that my son would be given a hundred lashes and a year's exile and his wife would be stoned. The prophet said, by the one in whose hand is my soul, I will certainly judge between you according to the book of God. The hundred goats and the servant should be returned to you and your son should be given a hundred lashes and exiled for a year. This is a narration of Sahih Bukhari. Gramdi Saab, it is being said that the Prophet said, I am making a decision according to the Book of God, whereas in the Book of God, the punishment for adultery was only 100 lashes. You have stated it in exile as well. Both the punishments have been stated in the Book of God. The punishment of fornication has been stated in Surah An-Nur as 100 lashes. We have explained that this is the ultimate punishment. When the crime of fornication is committed, God Almighty has stated the same punishment. And regarding this as well, it should be clear that this is the highest punishment. That is, when the crime is in the last degree and the criminal is not worthy of any leniency in terms of his circumstances, then this punishment will be given. Another crime has been stated that some people commit aggression in the matter of life, in the matter of honor, in the matter of wealth. Their punishment has been stated in Surah Maida. There, a punishment has also been stated. Such criminals should be banished. As a result of committing both these crimes, the Prophet has given two punishments to his son. That is, the 100 lashes punishment in the crime of adultery, according to Surah An-Nur, and in the crime of aggression, the punishment of one year of exile, according to Surah Maida. This is absolutely correct, and it is according to the Quran. The point has become clear. We move ahead, Khamdi Sahab. There are many narrations about the punishment of the grave. There are many details in them. What will be the dealings with different groups? What will be the questions and answers? It is said that whatever is being stated in them, the Quran is devoid of it. That is the entire concept, the explanation and clarification of the Quran regarding the punishment of the grave, whereas the whole concept of the punishment of the grave is only mentioned in the Hadith. All that has been stated is in the Quran. The Quran has stated that when we depart from this world, what are the matters dealt with at the time of death? How do the angels speak to the righteous? How do they speak to those who have gone against God's guidance and then didn't repent? How do all these conversations take place? What are the questions and answers in them? They have been quoted in the Quran at various places. After that, obviously the question arises that death has occurred. So now, the day of judgment, we don't know when it is going to come. What will be the situation until then? The basic principles of it have been stated by the Quran. It has been stated that those people who are so pious and virtuous that there is no need for any accounting. Like in the era of the prophets, the people who brought faith as the truthful ones, whom God gives glad tidings in the world, the same has happened with the group of the noble companions. The ones who were earliest in accepting faith have been given glad tidings in the Quran. The emigrants have been given glad tidings in the Quran. The helpers have been given glad tidings in the Quran. The companions of the Pledge of Ridwan have been given glad tidings in the Quran. These are the people for whom God's decision was revealed in the world. So what happens with these people in the Barzakh, that is, in the grave, what happens? The Quran has stated that they receive the blessings of God, they live this life within Barzakh, they receive these blessings morning and evening. In the Rabbihim Yurzakun, they are provided for by their Lord. The Quran has stated the second point as well. Similarly, it has been made clear that those people upon whom the prophets completed the proof and they stood against them with rebellion, their punishment is decided in this world. They are punished in this world like the punishment came upon the people of Ad, came upon the people of Tamud, came upon the people of Shu'aib. The Quran has made it clear that their punishment continues in the grave as well. Thus, regarding Pharaoh and the people of Pharaoh, it has been explicitly stated that morning and evening their abode is shown to them. After this, the remaining people about them, it has been told that they are all sleeping in their graves. They will be raised on the day of judgment, and after that, 
they will be accounted for. So whatever has been stated by the Prophet in light of these principles, we should understand it in light of these principles and should also look at it in relation to these statements of the Quran. You have clarified the topic of the punishment of the grave. We move ahead with the discussion. There are some other instructions which have been quoted in the collection of hadith regarding which it is said that clarification and elucidation are not found in the Quran. However, as Gramdi Sahab says, these will only be the clarification and elucidation of the original point mentioned in the Quran. Khamdi Sahab, the first thing that I present to you is that we read the narration in relation to the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, and in jurisprudence, a lot of legislation is done on its basis. The burden of proof is on the claimant, and the oath is on the one who denies. It is said that the person who makes a claim, the evidence is upon him, and the one who denies it, he can just take an oath. It is said that this topic is not under discussion in the Quran, which has been stated by the Prophet, peace be upon him. The fundamental point that has been stated is not correct. The fundamental point that has been stated, and you have elaborated on it, that the Prophet, peace be upon him, will only interpret and explain the Qur'an. When did I say this? When there is a point in the Qur'an, then it will be interpreted and explained. If there is nothing in the Qur'an, then we will apply the common moral principles. Very important point. We will apply the rational principles. We will give guidance, keeping in view the traditions of our time, all this is open to the Prophet to do. This has been stated in that narration in relation to the Prophet that you will look at the Book of God. If you do not find anything there, you will look at my Sunnah. If you do not find anything there, then you will use your intellect. So will the Prophet, peace be upon him, not use his intellect? Will the Prophet advise this to Sayyidina Mu'ad? May God be pleased with him, but he himself won't. They will see that there is a solution to this issue in the terms of knowledge and intellect. There has been guidance for it in human nature. Common moral principles can be applied to it. Such guidance is present in the collection of hadith in dozens of narrations. What has been said is that if something has become a topic in the Quran, then its interpretation and explanation will be made. And as far as things related to religion, that the Prophet has made clear, that is, it has become part of the Sunnah, then whatever will come in it will be a description of the practice of the Prophet. However, those things which have nothing to do with the Qur'an or the Sunnah, they are based on common sense, or they are based on the principles of their time, or they are said on the basis of the definitions of knowledge and intellect. All those things were stated by the Prophet as well. All the ijtihad is based on these principles. It is based on the Sunnah, that is, when is there a need for ijtihad. For this reason, there is a need for ijtihad when something is not found in the Qur'an, when something is not there in the Sunnah. So now we see whether any principle from the Qur'an or the Sunnah can be applied to a question. If we do not find that, then we see if there is something in the definitions of knowledge and intellect. If we do not find even that, then we see if there is any moral principle which can be put forward and said. So on this basis, the Prophet said, it is a very rational thing that the person who has made the allegation and presented a claim, he should provide evidence. It is rational. It is accepted all over the world. Who is it that denies it? But if someone does not have such a thing, he is making a claim that this land is mine. He has taken possession of it. He has done injustice to me. He has come with a claim. He has come to the court. The courts that exist today, do they read the Quran and tell people to present their arguments on it? They get it investigated as to whose name it is on. They will get it investigated. They will ask for a witness. They will tell people to present their arguments. I will go and file a case against you. So what will a judge demand from me? What will a judge of today demand? What will a judge of America demand? What will a judge of Britain demand? Well, he will demand evidence. So this is the definite point. The Prophet has also stated that if a person has denied that this is not right, and the argument could also not be presented from the other side, in that case, it is reasonable to ask him to at least swear so that it is known that he is speaking the truth. This is absolutely rational what he has said. Where did people go to find it in the Quran? Right, the point has become clear. We move ahead, Ghamdi Sahib. It has been said that in the hadiths, 
Many signs of the Day of Judgment are stated. There is a chapter on the signs of the Day of Judgment. Like the barefoot, naked shepherds will compete in building tall buildings. In the same way, there are some signs of the Day of Judgment approaching. The earth will disgorge its burdens. It is said that the origin of all these signs of the Day of Judgment is not in the Quran itself. It is purely related to news and religion. No, this too is based on the Quran. When the Quran gave the news of the Day of Judgment and also said that before it, some effects will appear. Now the Prophet is elaborating on it. God Almighty has declared the personality of Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, as a sign of the Day of Judgment. The advent of the Prophet, peace be upon him, as a sign of the Day of Judgment. The emergence of Gog and Magog as a sign of the Day of Judgment. This has been stated in principle that some things will come up before the Day of Judgment in this way. The Prophet has stated many things. He is the Messenger of God. What is there in it that is against the Qur'an? However, after doing some research, we will see whether it is proven or not. We will accept it. The point has been clarified. I present the last example from the Hadith. It is the narration. The Prophet said, the buyer and the seller have the right to buy and sell until they are separated from each other. That is, you have bought something and I did not like it, so I have to return it at the same time. If we are present at one place, you have to return it at the same time. It has been said that which principle of the Quran is this an actual explanation? It is the general rule which has been applied. This is the general rule. It is absolutely logical that nothing should be a cause of harm to others. There should not be any contradiction in anything. Keeping this in view, 10 new instructions can be given. The current legislation is based on the same principles. The mistake that people make in our society is that one status of the Prophet is that of being a Prophet or Messenger of God. In that capacity, he has conveyed the religion. Then there is a status of a scholar of religion in which he explains and clarifies the religion. Along with this, he is also a ruler. He is also the husband of wives. He has to make administrative decisions. These are the issues of ishtihad, in which he will give a lot of guidance. This is also of the same nature. All such things should be kept under the same title. The point has become clear. What is the hadith? Under this title, in this session, we have asked different questions to Ghamdi Sahib. There are some other questions as well. Inshallah, we will be back again. The time ends here. Thank you very much for your time till now.